they are really pioneer in their field and they are going to give their experience to us and they share their experience and we will all learn their techniques and whatever the problems complications we are facing day to day will definitely uh, they are really pioneer and uh, once again I welcome and enjoy the meeting thank you thank you very much Thank you. Can I talk? Yes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar, for the welcome speech. And now I request uh, Professor Rajiv Naik, sir, to introduce us to this course. He heard, he can't hear. He heard. He heard. He heard. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Professor Shaskar, could you, can you hear us? Perfectly. Okay. Uh, my, my pleasure to welcome both of you um, and the other esteemed faculty uh, for this course on the Bangalore Trauma course. Both of you have been here before and uh, it is our pleasure to have you on the webinar, if not in person. Hopefully, in, in times to come, we would see you personally here again. Uh, with this brief introduction, a lot of uh, delegates are wanting to hear from you. They have lined up a few questions already for you, sir. And uh, Professor Shaskar, uh, you please take it over from here and present your uh, paper. We have another five minutes uh, before you start off, sir, as per our time. Uh, is it okay if we can, uh, if you can take some questions from the audience just now? Yes, certainly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the one question from the uh, one question the audience wants to know is what is the present understanding of micro motion in fracture healing? Is it micro motion that is necessary or is it compression that is necessary? And if so, whether you, you should use a compression plate or you should use a bridge plate. This is a question uh, that has been given to me to ask you. Very well. That all depends on the specific situation. Let me say at the very outset that angular stability has not changed the laws of fracture healing. If you are dealing with a bone where you have done an open reduction and in doing so you have devitalized the bone ends, you require absolute stability to achieve union. That was the great advance of the AO in introducing compression, interfragmental compression. That is one situation. If you have done an indirect reduction and if you have not invaded the fracture area but have allowed it to be protected with its surrounding soft tissue and blood supply, then under those circumstances, you want to introduce motion in order to stimulate callus formation and union. So we have two completely distinct and separate situations. Uh, I hope I have answered the question. Yes. Yes, sir. 
the delegate is what you are saying. Uh, uh, sir, uh, sir, he further asks you a question. Yes. Whether uh, there is any role for bridge creating in non union. No. Simply, the answer is no. If you have a non-union, you have a very different situation from fracture healing. A non-union will not heal with bridge plating. Actually, what you do is you somewhere, somewhere. This is not near to this. Oh, you start, sir. You start. Would you let me know, please, when you would like me to start? Hi, uh, yes, sir. Now, now everything is settled. Uh, the delegate wants your reply as to whether there is any role for bridge plating in non-unions. I, I have attempted to answer. Let me try again. You obviously did not hear my answer. Yeah. You can... A, a non-union... It's a different situation. It means that instability has resulted in non-union. And if you simply bridge the non-union with a plate, it won't heal. You have to do something to provide stability as well as a stimulus to union. So in addition to bridging the non-union with a plate, you have to add a bone graft in order to secure a bony bridge. Once the bony bridge heals, you then have a situation of absolute stability, and then the tissues will gradually remodel. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, uh, now, uh, uh, please start with your presentation. Very well. Well, let me say greetings to all of you in India and in Germany. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have the opportunity to speak and address you today. There are very few advantages to growing old. The one advantage is that uh, in growing old, I'm able to speak to you with personal experience when I speak about the reality of the 1970s and the progress we have made. Because I have participated with the progress in 1970s and therefore what I will be speaking about is from personal experience. Thus when I say that I must take you back to the days of smoke-filled lecture theaters, 
I take you back to the reality when in a the projector, the atmosphere is blue and haze with the smoke which used to fill the lecture theaters. That fortunately has disappeared. Those were the days when slides were very primitive. We had the, the atmosphere blue text slides. Those were the days of the early projectors, the early Kodak carousel projectors and the open lights trays which were available in Europe. And also the days of the two and a half inch glass slides which were changed manually. Those were the days of conservative treatment and of its outcomes. And I'm demonstrating for you such a case of a tibial plateau fracture, which was treated conservatively in traction and has resulted in a non-union with a terrible deformity. You might ask, well, what did we have, what sort of diagnostic aids did we have available in the 1970s? Well, clinically, what we have to this very day and what will continue, namely our eyes and our hands and history of the trauma and the physical examination <laughs> continue to be underlying principles of proper care. When it comes to imaging, all that we had available and were plain history of the trauma and the physical a examination continued to be we could underlying principles. We had two plain tomography. We had stress examinations and we had arteriography. What was the available literature? Well, we had the famous Bibles, the Watson Jones textbooks in the English speaking world. We had Baylor's books in German. In the 1950s, we had the famous Charnley book, The Close Treatment of Common Fractures. We had Campbell's Operative Orthopedics, but in that text published in 1963, there are only one and a half pages on the principles of internal fixation. It virtually still didn't exist. The AO had published the techniques of internal fixation in 1965, and then in 1970, the famous manual uh, of operative fracture care uh, appeared, first in German and the following year in English. The operating rooms were filled with a collection of implants, usually of screws and plates of different manufacturers different metals, and very few things actually fitted. In North America, we had only the beginner's set of the AO. We had not, nothing that you would call specialized tools. We had no bone substitutes. We didn't have any bone banks. Allografts were not in use. Fracture tables were mostly used to treat fractured hips. We didn't have any translucent tables. 
it was a very, very primitive environment. I'm sure you will agree. The imaging which was available, as I have already said, were plain x-rays and the tomography. We didn't have any ultrasound. We didn't have any CT. We didn't have any CT and geography, venography. We didn't have anything that was in three dimension. There was no intraoperative fluoroscopy. Sea arms didn't exist. We didn't have any intraoperative image guidance other than two plain x-rays. Surgical education was still in its primitive stages. In North America, it was university-based, but there wasn't such a thing as a curriculum. Few centers had courses in surgery, but none in orthopedics. In Europe, at, in the early 1970s, there was no organized education. It was all based on institutions. And for your education, you chose an institution. And surgical education was based on the mentor principle, namely my way of doing things. There were no underlying principles. You did what your mentor taught you to do. That's how I treat this. That's how I treat that. There was no standardized body of knowledge or an agreed curriculum. And clearly, under such circumstances, qualifications varied widely. Imagine a world without computers, a world without databases, a world without internet, a world without fax, and no iPhone, and no iPad, and no Professor Google. If we wanted to make a slide, we first had to photograph the object. It had to be typed. It had to go to a photographer. It took days, sometimes weeks, to get anything back. And transfer of images from one university or from one hospital to another, it didn't exist. Those were, that was the world in which I practiced at my beginning. When it came to research, we had primitive attempts at databases. What did it consist of? It consisted of large glued sheets of paper, which we used to spread out on the floor of a room and covered it with columns. We didn't have a database. We didn't have any agreed classification systems to make studies possible. Evidence-based medicine had not been invented as yet. There was no such thing as prospective documentation all studies were retrospective. And of course, there was a tremendous loss of cases. And there were no collaborative studies. In 1974, I published my classification of tibial plateau fractures. It was based on a retrospective analysis of cases treated in Toronto over a period of four years. It was based on a chart review, an x-ray review. And when I attempted 
To form a database, I simply lumped likes with likes. In order to reach some valid conclusions. There was no such thing as an interpersonal or intrapersonal agreement. There were no principles guiding any classification. Early systems simply represented the author's concepts. In my classification, I based it on age and organized the cases in an ascending order based on morphology from simple to complex. It was based on bone quality and on the amount of energy involved in producing the fracture. And I introduced the concept of instability. In those days, we did not look at stability and instability. That concept was not as yet in existence. So it was a pioneering step. I would like to remind you of the principles of fracture care of the 1960s to 1980s. We practiced immediate surgery, atraumatic anatomical reduction of the joint surface, and so on. What did we have for preoperative planning? It was based on imaging, but all we had were two plain x-rays and tomography. So everything that we had existed in two dimensions. The patient was always positioned supine on the operating table. Intubation didn't exist. And thus, a prone position of an anesthetized patient was impossible. And we didn't have anything that you would call a translucent table. The plain x-rays clearly exist to this very day and have their use. We had stress examination under anesthesia, and these yield a tremendous amount of information and are useful to this very day. But the question came how to build a three-dimensional image of the injury. And I would remind you of the dictum that an orthopedic surgeon had to have the ability to think in three dimensions. Because the only thing available to the surgeon were images in two dimensions, classifications in two dimensions, and so on. It was only at surgery, when the surgeon exposed the fracture, that he had an appreciation in three dimension of what he was dealing with. And unfortunately, at that point, it is often too late to correct the mistake of a wrong surgical approach. When it came to tibial plateau fractures, there was also a progression in thinking. What were the incisions that were common? Well, it was either the lazy S or the hockey stick, or an approach popularized in the early days by the AO, the so-called Mercedes-Benz incision, which created three flaps, devitalized tissue, and was a disaster. There was progress, and with time, we progressed from curved incisions to a straight incision. And in complex fractures, approaches existed such as osteotomy of the tibial tubercle 
in order to turn up the extensor mechanism to gain a three-dimensional view of the situation. What did the approaches have in common? Well, they were all from in front. There was no such thing as a posterior medial or a posterior lateral approach. And posterior, that was tiger country. We were taught to stay away from any such thing. Well, the question is, now in the 1970s, how did we do? Well, this is the situation of a young Olympic skier who sustained a very difficult intraarticular fracture, a tibial plateau fracture. Approach from in front, in this case, with a incision of the infrapatellar tendon, holding the patella up, this is what you had to deal with. We learned to piece the pieces together. You see the intraoperative x-ray with provisional fixation. You see the x-ray at the end of the procedure. We also used something popularized actually in my city in Toronto, continuous passive motion by Professor Salter. And if we were lucky and followed all available principles, we did have success. Otherwise, operative treatment would have died. But success was not common. We had many successes, but we also had terrible failures. And failures were usually breakdown of the incision and osteomyelitis and often amputation. And this was the result of indiscriminate early surgery which led to a high incidence of soft tissue complications. And the literature was full of such statements that it was the dead bone which was the cause of the breakdown and of the disaster. We were focused on bone. In the very early days, unfortunately, we faced, faced a failure to recognize that the soft tissue played a major role in the complexity of the injury, that it is the soft tissue injury and how it is dealt with that determines success or failure. And the first 20 years of the AO were full of indiscriminate early surgery. And unfortunately, that continues to this very day. People must learn to differentiate between low energy and high energy fractures because that determines what happens to the soft tissue envelope. And thus when we come, and I shall use here the example of the tibial plateau, but this applies to any fracture anywhere else on the amount of energy involved in producing it. And low velocity injuries where the soft tissue damage is slight, those are situations where early surgery is possible. These are not the high velocity injuries, the fracture dislocations, the types four, five, and six, where you're dealing with high energy, where the damage to the soft tissue is great, and where you must delay 
the definitive intervention. And the only emergencies in fracture surgery are open fractures, compartment syndromes, and where you have vascular or neurological complications. Those are the, really the only emergencies. Now we come to the progress in imaging. That began in the late 1970s, early 1980s, with the introduction of the CT, and then the progression to the three-plane reconstruction. This opened the door to the appreciation of fractures in the coronal plane. Up to that point, fractures in the coronal plane were frequently missed because they were not appreciated. We also were able to achieve the three-dimensional reconstruction of the fracture surface anatomy, and that is extremely helpful to this day. It was the introduction of new principles. This was the introduction of the principle fracture plane, a concept which is essential when it comes to the management of fractures. It allowed us to decide with definitive accuracy where to position the buttress plate. It has to be positioned in the same plane as the principal fracture plane. That is the ideal position of a buttress plate. This concept was not possible till we began to have a three-dimensional picture of the fracture. It also gave us the advantage of noting whether the fracture was anterior or posterior, terribly important in preoperative planning because it dictates the approach and the positioning of the patient. However, we didn't have any notation which allowed us to write down in a simple form the three-dimensional concept of a fracture. Mauricio Kfuri, my colleague with whom I have collaborated for a number of years, asked me one day a very important question when we were discussing tibial plateau fractures, namely, Joe, how can we tell people exactly where the lesion is that has to be addressed in order to regain stability of the fracture? This rather simple question led to a major stimulus of CT studies, first of over 100 fractures, to validate the classification, but it led to new anatomical appreciations, and Maurizio Kfuri is the originator of the concept of the virtual equator and of the four quadrants which define the limits of surgical exposure. What do I mean by this? The virtual equator is a concept. It is not an anatomical structure, but it relies on anatomical structures for its definition, namely the tubercle on the head of the proximal fibula, the insertion of the collateral ligament, and the posterior edge of the medial collateral ligament. 
These are points easily available on the, the axial cut of a CT or of an MRI. This defines the lateral collateral ligament and the medial collateral ligament. And it defines the four quadrants. If you divide the tibial plateau and the collateral ligaments define the limits of surgical exposure. And so we progress in concepts. We began to speak that outcome depends on stability, not just articular congruity, and we must achieve a straight leg. Let's analyze these. What defines stability? Well, clearly, deviation from the anatomical axis, the metaphyseal deformity, the axial malalignment defines instability in that situation. What defines stability in articular fractures? What, well, when we come to soft tissues, clearly the ligamentous and capsular disruption, but those are terribly important soft tissue structures. But when we come to the bone itself, Are all articular fractures the same? An impaction is clearly very different from a rim lesion. And this is the first that I have mentioned, the concept of the rim of the joint as something which is terribly important because it is the rim lesion which determines joint instability. A simple impaction with the rim intact, unless it is a rare massive impaction, usually that lesion does not determine instability. But if you have a rim lesion, then with the disruption of the rim, you have a situation of instability. And I would like to introduce you to the concept of the wedge. The wedge is a three-dimensional structure we do not have time to go into the mechanics of production of fractures, but articular fractures are the result of shear and impaction. And it is the shearing force which splits off a three-dimensional wedge, and it is the displacement of the wedge, the loss of rim continuity that determines joint instability. Having said that, let me show you now how we have used the concept of joint stability in order to allow a way of defining in writing the anatomy of the fracture. Here we have a type two tibial plateau fracture. However, it is a type two with an anterior and a posterior split wedge. And both have to be addressed surgically when it comes to reconstructing 
rim continuity and restoring stability of the joint. So how do we define were the split wedge the key to joint stability occurs? We note where the rim has been split. And thus, as I have illustrated, in this a more complex in a type five, well, we have a medial posterior split wedge. And on the lateral side, we have an anterior and beginning to have the ability to represent in writing a concept of the fracture in three dimension. And this I published with Maurizio Quarry as the extension of the Schatzker classification in three dimension. So in summary, the progress we have made to improve outcomes has been the notation of new anatomical landmarks, the concept of the virtual equator, and the concept of the four quadrants, which are defined by the collateral ligaments, which define the ease of surgical exposure and access to the fracture. And most of all, I would focus you on the importance of the loss of rim continuity when we come to speak of joint stability. The loss of rim continuity is the key. There are many fractures where the articular surface disruption may be beyond surgical reconstruction. But if we regain rim continuity, if we reduce anatomically the split wedge, we will succeed in restoring joint stability and a good outcome. Thus, the new contributions is the extension of our concepts of a fracture in three dimension. The morphology in three dimension is terribly important. We are now able to speak with one language in defining fractures that we are dealing with. And this three dimension allows multi semper study and research. This new information facilitates planning and execution of a stable joint, a congruous articular surface, and a straight limb, and will greatly facilitate the achievement of better outcomes. In conclusion, you had a glimpse of the dark ages of tibial plateau surgery and its struggles, and really it defines the history of fracture treatment. Using the tibial plateau, I was able to allow you to follow the steps of progress which have allowed today's levels of expertise and excellence of surgery. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you about this subject, which is so very dear to me and my interests. I thank you for the opportunity to take your time to review this subject. And I wish to say goodbye to all the delegates and participants. Thank you.
Professor Shaskar, uh, thank you very much. And there are some questions. Would you like to take them, sir? Yes, definitely. There is a question from the audience. Uh, when would you consider bone grafting with the advent of block plates? Locked plates bone grafting. are a simply a way of achieving stability between the fragment and the plate. It doesn't change in any way the laws of fracture healing. So in order to answer the question, yes, if you're using locked plating because you're dealing with an intraarticular or metaphyseal injury, it will allow you to achieve better grasp or better stability between the fragment and the plate. But it doesn't change in any way what happens as far as the treatment of the fracture itself. If it requires a bone graft, then of course you will be bone grafting. Um, so just to clarify that a little bit further, uh, whenever there is any bone void, irrespective of the plate that you use, you still need to fill the void. Is that correctly understood, sir? Well, you are using a lock plate to achieve stability, as I have said, between the, frag the distal or articular fragment metaphyseal fragment and the plate <laughs> but it hasn't done anything when it comes to the treatment of the fracture so if you have done an open reduction and devitalized the fragments then you would seriously consider bone grafting but if you're using a locked plate then you will have achieved likely the reduction by indirect means. You will not have invaded the fracture zone. You will have preserved the ability of callus formation and a bone graft will not be necessary. This has nothing to do with bone grafting in order to feel to fill a metaphyseal defect to prevent the loss of reduction of articular stability. We are now dealing with healing in the metaphyseal area. I hope that is clear. Yes, sir. Um, there is another question. A late presentation of Shaskar 5 and uh, type, six, uh, type 6, how do you manage them if they reach to you 2-3 months after, after injury? Well, I, at the very beginning, showed an example and uh, exactly of a late presentation of a type 6 tibial plateau fracture where the deformity existed in two planes. We had a flexion deformity and a varus deformity. And in order to treat such a situation, you must carry out osteotomies in the principal plane, in the coronal plane and in the sagittal plane 
in order to correct the deformity, which is in two separate planes. And once corrected, you, you correct the problem. I'm sorry, I don't have the opportunity to show you the details uh, of that first case that I used to illustrate the situation. Um, one more question from the audience. A bicontroller fracture is a single locked lateral plate enough to hold the medial condyle? That's a very important question. The answer is, it depends on what is the lesion like medially. Whether there is cortical support or whether there is a void. If you're dealing with an open fracture and there has been loss of bone medially, under those situations, a lateral plate will not be enough. It all depends on the architecture of the medial cortex. Uh, a good medial condyle is a lateral plate enough? Well, if there is contact between the major fragments medially, once reduced, a lateral plate is enough, yes. Another question from the audience. Would you recommend an MRI scan as well in, a, so in uh, along with CT or is only a CT scan enough? Today, in a complex fracture, we recommend very strongly an MRI as well because we are beginning to appreciate the importance of the soft tissue lesions which we neglected. Some require surgical attention and some do not, but an MRI will allow us to have a much better idea of the mechanism of the fracture. It will identify the, le the soft tissue lesions as well as the, the new MRI are almost as good as a CT in defining the architecture of the bone. So an MRI is necessary in a complex fracture. Professor Wagner, do you want to ask any questions to Professor Shaskar? No, no, thank you. But it's also my experience over the last 30 years that we have underestimated the soft tissues for decades. Well, I'm happy to hear that we agree completely. Yes, of course. <laughs> Any other questions? I would like to take this opportunity, if I may, to say a special hello to Professor Wagner. Also, hello to Canada and to uh, Joe Schatzka. It's always a great pleasure to be with you on the panel, and it's a great honor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, sir, since we have uh, no more questions from the audience, um, we sincerely thank you for uh, having accepted our request and delivered this fine lecture. Thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Arun Mulaji. Arun Mulaji. He'll be joining two minutes. You want to go to to Michael? Arun Mulaji said, "Let's go." Be there in five minutes.
Professor Shaskar, one more question has come. Yes. Uh, MIPO in intra-articular fractures. Uh, your own textbook was not very fond of MIPO in intra-articular fractures. Do you still hold that view, sir? Well, MIPO stands for minimally invasive plate osteosynthesis. Uh, it doesn't allow you a reduction of the articular surface. Remember, when you're dealing with articular fractures, you're dealing with the complex situation. You're dealing not only with stability due to the splitting off of a split wedge fragment, creating discontinuity of the rim, but you're also dealing with articular surface. And you have to attend to both. How often you you recommend a posterior plating for posterior fractures or can you approach uh, the fragment from anteriorly only this is a very complex subject that, that you are addressing namely the posterior tibial plateau fracture uh, the posterior medial approach is very simple and when you're dealing with a type 5 or a type 6 tibial plateau fracture, almost always a posterior medial plate is used in order to secure stability of the medial split wedge. Laterally, the, the principles are the same, but the approach is definitely more difficult and laterally the fragment itself is usually much smaller and oftentimes it can be left without special surgical attention but if attention is needed then it is approached either by doing an osteotomy through the neck of the fibula or an epicondylar osteotomy to allow access posteriorly. Uh, thank you, sir. We request next. Uday Kumar. We request uh, Uday Kumar to conduct the next session. Thank 
Yeah, can I talk to you? We go on to the next uh, session by Dr. Arun Mulaji, who will speak to us about TKR after fractures and fractures after TKR. Dr. Arun Mulaji is a joint replacement surgeon from Mumbai, India. Has he gone? I would like uh, Dr. Arun Mullaji to present his, uh, his findings to the audience, please. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see your screen. And can you hear me? Yeah, we are able to hear you. Voice of the gender equality and not fracture fix. <coughs> Most speakers are advised never to start with an apology. Till last night I could speak, but from this morning I lost my voice. Of course my wife is delighted. Thank you for inviting me, Siri, to speak in this meeting. Aaron Mulligy tried to change my voice to a male one, but I protested as these are the days of gender equality, and I threatened to sue him. Fact is the nerd couldn't figure out how to change my voice. It is an absolute honor to share the platform with Dr. Shatsko and Dr. Wagner. As you guys are the experts in trauma, I stick to talking about TKRs and not fracture fixation. I shall cover in part one, TKR after fractures. These are the 10 reasons why you should not undertake TKR after fractures lightly. Although survival range and survivorship for these TKRs is almost the same or slightly lower, the complication rate is much higher, and these are some of the complications. Meticulous planning is required, rays, CT, Mr. Infection Workup, assessing soft tissue cover, whether hardware removal is needed for specific instruments, births or also one needs to select the implant. Usually PS suffices, constrained once occasionally if ligamentous insufficiency, and sometimes if bone loss, instability, low demand patient. Tumor prosthesis is barely needed for large defects and communion. Augments, stems, sleeves may need to be kept on standby. What about the timing of TKR? Should it be at same or into stages? This depends on soft tissue condition, scars, whether extensive implants, and if there's concern regarding infection, if in doubt perhaps it's safer to remove implants, send tissue fluid for culture, wait six, eight weeks before doing a TKR. Now let's look at some examples. Third why old F doctor presented 16 Y after medial condyle fracture with missing fragment. We did a bicompartmental arthroplasty patum and medial uni. This was a conservatively treated tibial plateau fracture in a 76-year-old male. A straightforward <laughs> arm in this 59-year-old female with an acute fracture of the lateral condyle, we gave her both up or if versus TKR, she opted for the latter. We packed the defect with bone from various cuts and added a stem. 
This was a lateral plateau fracture on the left side with osteoarthritis of the right knee in an 80 years old lady and navigated simultaneous bilateral TK was done with stem. Someone had used extra granules to elevate this lateral plateau fracture. We did a rotating platform TKR to give more motion. This was a patient with valgus deformity two years after all the plateau fracture. We used to separate incisions as wide apart as possible. In this 76-year-old male patient with a malunited lateral plateau fracture with valgus OA, in the first stage, implant removal was done. Six weeks later, a TKR. In this 53 years old male with a malunited proximal tibial fracture with pain from varus OA, we did a corrective closed web osteotomy and used a long stem tibial component. In this 70 year male with a malunited distal femoral fracture, we did a closed wedge osteotomy with TKR. This was an opinion in a 74 year old female. Distal femoral replacement was done. In this 63-year-old male, six months after ORIF, became an infected non-union, we put in a rod with antibiotic spacer and after sepsis was taken care of, a distal femoral replacement was done. In this 60-100kg weight male, who had road traffic accident, ORIF was done, and then a TKR elsewhere, Acute post-op infection occurred and the index surgeon inserted a spacer. We did second stage revision to her after waiting for one year and multiple negative cultures. Unfortunately, recurrent infection occurred after two years and a few was needed to recap. Now let's look at revision to KR after paraprosthetic fractures, and we will focus on distal femoral ones. These are increasing exponentially. These are some patient, surgeon, and implant risk factors. Specific risk factors for femoral fractures are notching, constrained implants, vigorous impaction, and stress rises. A careful assessment should be done by taking detailed history of the pre-fracture TKR performance, comparison with earlier sprays to rule out loosening and infection. Key factors to consider are listed here principally the patient, fracture and plant characteristics. While these are the two, we shall look at one example of Warrior and then revision TKRs. This was a 60 year old female weighing 100 kilograms with bilateral OA, presenting six months after bariatric surgery. She fell on the fifth post op day. We did a dual plating, and these are the two year follow up sprays. Indications for revision TKR are listed here. These are the Include very low distal femoral fractures where nail or plate plate fixation isn't realistic. There's poor bone stop and loosening internal fixation contra indicated or likely to fail or has been attempted and fails. Patient unable to bear partial weight, ligamentous instability, failed implants with loosening, malposition, where implant known to have limited lifespan has been recalled or is extinct, PJI, metastatic lesion. Let's see some examples here. There was a stopsis, tibial and implant fracture, and the tibia was revised with a long stem. In this patient with a Felix type IV tibial tub avulsion, we used a rotating hinge, fixed the tuberosity, and reinforced the patella tendon with safety. This patient operated elsewhere, presented three months post-op. We used an augment and stem. These are immediate post-op bilateral TKS rays. 
she stumbled post-operatively. We revised the femoral components with long stems. This was an elderly lady who fell three months post-op. After a failed attempt to fix the fractures, a distal femoral replacement was done. Similar story in this rheumatoid patient operating. This lady had an aura for a periprosthetic fracture, both done elsewhere, and this is what we did. This is my 93-year-old teacher, professor of gynecology, two years post-op, TK are done by me. She fell and that's what we did. That's her at one year post-op. Finally, this is an ununited infected fracture after a TK and elsewhere and sent to us after hardware removal. We used a rod cement spacer and then in the second stage provided her to a femoral replacement. In summary, revision TK for paraprosthetic fracture requires fixation if surgeon is experienced in trauma, has full array of implants, there's the both quality, and if patient is younger, tumor prosthesis may be the preferred option in elderly, low-demand patients. But this has to be weighed against the costs, risk of infection, patella problems, rotational alignment, and leg length resistance. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Arun Mulaji, for your talk. Uh, if your voice is uh, okay, will you be able to take any questions? Or shall we proceed to the next speaker? Can we'll proceed? To, thank you, Dr. Arun Mulaji, for your wonderful talk. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And uh, we will go to the next uh, speaker. Now I request Dr. Ram Subareli to and Dr. Raju Naik to come to the next speaker, Professor Michael Wagner. Adan Bandil, ma. Professor Wagner, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I can you see? see there are no. Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, it's loading. We can, we can see. We can see your. Okay. Uh, Professor Wagner will be speaking on intraoperative errors in TKR, a very common problem. How to identify and correct them? Yes, Professor Wagner. You can see my screen? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> good evening to India and good morning to Canada. At first, I have to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's always a great pleasure to talk with my friends in India, and it's always a great honor to speak together with Joe Schatzka. Now, I want to speak about intraoperative errors in total knee replacement. And, no, oh, okay. Uh, this is the last, something, something is wrong, sorry about that. <laughs> Could you reshare the screen, Professor? Okay. Do you see my screen? Not yet. No. No? Okay. I don't know what has happened here. Sorry for the delay. Just try again, Professor. Click on the share, share button. And try again. Sorry for that. Yeah. 
Uh, professor, just click on the share tray button, the third button from your left. Yes. Here it is. Yeah. Does it work? It's loading. It's yeah. loading. loading. It, it's loading now. It's loading. Oh, it's loading now. Okay. Now, the results of our total knee replacement, they are not so bad, but still we have uh, complications. And as we have learned over the last years, it's mainly a soft tissue problem. I think it's the same as we have in fracture treatment. And this made me uh, in the late 80s from a quick bone surgeon later to a considering soft tissue surgeon because soft tissue problems are the most challenging uh, problems in knee surgery. And there are, of course, some typical errors. At first, I think poor surgical technique, sometimes wrong implants, the malpositioning of implants, damaging ligaments, which is leading to instability. And many of them are very difficult to be repaired. And most intraoperative errors are a result of bad or no preoperative planning. And the failure to plan, I think, is a plan to fail. Here you see a typical example, a very bad planning. The position of the tibia is very poor and the patella is even worse. Oh, look here. Again, this is a real surgical mistake, as you can see it here. A hemi, but it's hurting for many years. Why? The femoral component is too big. So if you have any uh, concern that your preoperative planning does not fit to your intraoperative situation, of course, do an immediate fluoroscopy. This will prevent a lot of trouble after surgery. And very common in uh, knee replacement revision surgery is instability. Loosening is not the problem in knee revision surgery. You can have a varus or valgus instability and the AP instability. Normally, you will not detect it very early, sometimes overextension of the knee. And as we have learned in the past, the mid-flexion instability, the unstable patella, and sometimes everything in the knee is unstable, as you can see it here, all result of bad surgical technique. Now, varus or valgus instability, if the knee becomes intraoperatively unstable, usually is a damage of the collateral ligaments uh, by the oscillating soul. Now, what to treat there? There are some papers of a ligament repair. There is some literature from China or what we prefer if such a rare situation is occurring, we are going for a semi-constrained or even a rotational hinge implant. But in our service, this is a very rare uh, situation. Here you see this from a paper from China, how they uh, fix this problem when they have cut intraoperatively the medial collateral. And I'm always wondering why they can publish major series. Now, the more common intraoperative instability is the patella. And you can have different problems. If you have a very stiff knee, it can happen that you have a banana peel effect at the, at the ligament and the <clears throat> ligament is disappearing from the tibial tubercle. So if you have this banana peel effect, stop 
soft tissue release immediately. Think about a rectus snip or an osteotomy of the tibia tubercle. And if you have to repair the patella tendon, always use a McLaughlin circlage, otherwise you will fail. And if you only have weakened the insertion of the patella, insert two cock screws anchors for reinforcement of your ligament and be a little bit reluctant with the physiotherapy. And if you see such a situation intraoperatively, then it's always a disaster and you do not have to believe in miracle. Such a subluxation of the patella cannot be treated by a soft tissue procedure. It is in almost all cases an internal rotation of the femoral component. So you have to correct the position of the femoral component, check the patella stability always before the insertion of the definite components. And um, if patella is not uh, functioning well intraoperatively, no, it will never function. Oh, I see. So and I never see. accept surgical errors at the end of the operation. Oh, this is a typical case. Here you see there is a slight instability, obviously, and there yeah. is a negative slope. And if you leave this, you see the knee becomes more and more unstable, and then you end up with a nasty fracture. So never accept uh, bad positions intraoperatively. Check it as precise as possible. Sometimes we are facing the mid-flexion instability. The knee is stable in extension and in 90 degrees of flexion, but unstable in mid-flexion. Very often the joint line is too high, uh, the femoral component too much ventral, and the MCL is insufficient. So uh, many of these knees have very high polyliners and if you have an unconstrained prosthesis and you have a poly 15 millimeters or even more, think about mid-flexion instability. It is very common and in many standard examinations you will not detect this. And you have to think a little bit about your joint line. There are many methods how you can uh, calculate your joint line. And, oh, oh, sorry, I pushed the wrong button. It's my fault. Sorry about that. Oh, it's this ugly computer at home. Sorry for this inconvenience. Sorry. Now we are back at the joint line. Now can you see the screen? And here you see a typical example of a bad joint line. Look where the tip of the fibula is. And here you see it is much too high. And this is even a danger for a constrained knee, as you can see it here in mid flexion, it will dislocate. Or here, a negative slope. There is an overextension of the knee, and you can not solve this problem of overextension with a higher uh, poly. You have always to revise the tibia. And again, some more examples of <coughs> poor surgery. You have to tighten your screws properly. 
as you can see it here, this must not happen. And sometimes your problems are not very easily be detected, as you can see it here. This is a semi-constrained knee, and the patient has a lot of pain, and nobody detects it. What is the problem? The poly popped out of the tibia component, but of course it is not easy, uh, easily to be seen here. And you cannot correct instability with posterior stabilized component, as you can see it in this uh, example. An 80-year-old lady, she got a surface replacement of the knee and it was unstable. And then they converted it to a posterior stabilized knee. Again, it's only stress for the extensor mechanism. And if you are inserting modular components, be careful to do the proper mounting of your components with the appropriate instruments. In this X-ray film, it is not very easily to be detected, but later on, at the femoral component, you see there is a lot of uh, osteolysis and resorption around, and now you have the full disaster. So be a little bit careful and always remove your osteophytes properly. Properly, you see here, if you do not uh, remove them at the posterior aspect, you get impingement, you damage your poly component, and this is always very painful. So be careful. A real challenge, again, is soft tissue. Don't sacrifice the blood supply of the skin. If you have had previous surgery, use the most lateral incision for your total knee replacement. So be very careful. Uh, if you end up with skin necrosis, you get into severe trouble and never leave the knee open. And if you have such a defect, think about uh, doing a flap procedure Gastrocnemius uh, flap is not so difficult, but never leave the knee open. Otherwise, it is prone to infection. If you do an osteotomy of the greater of the tuberosity, then keep the tuberosity fragment always big. Create a step to avoid upward, upwards migration. And the screw fixation must be always in the posterior cortex of the tibia. Otherwise, you will fail. Use normally 6.5 millimeter screws, that's enough. But this type of fixation, which is not hitting the posterior uh, cortex, will always fail 100% you can be very assured. So you have to avoid problems, not to detect the problems intraoperatively. You have to avoid the problems and you avoid them best if you do a good preoperative planning. With a good preoperative planning, you detect the problems before the skin incision. If you are in the OR, if in doubt, use fluoroscopy. Be prepared using more constrained implants. Uh, if you have a sudden problem of instability, you probably have to move for a semi-constrained or a hinge prosthesis. And of course, always a precise surgical uh, technique, which always starts with pre-operative planning. And then you can also do difficult cases here is one of our service, a real challenging problem. Again, the soft tissue is the most challenging part of the procedure. She had a tibia fracture, which was not 
uh, very successfully treated. And now what to do? She is really obese. She has a severe unstable osteoarthritis of her left knee and a non-union of her tibia. Now, I, you only need a good preoperative planning. At first, you have to exclude infection. You see in the CAT scan that there is definitely a non-union, and then you have to do surgery respecting biology and the soft tissue. And you see here, quite simple operation, just lining up the tibia on the long stem. And you have to believe in biology. Because when you have stability, the non-union heals. And then you can think about knee surgery on the right side. So keep in mind, good results come from good experience, but good experience comes from bad results. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Wagner, for your excellent talk. Uh, any questions from the audience? <coughs> yes, sir. You can talk. Professor Wagner, there is a question from the audience. Which... Uh, Huh? Which uh, implants do you prefer? A posterior reference, reference implant or an anterior reference implant? Posterior reference implant, but you have to be very uh, careful. Uh, if you have uh, major deformities, uh, but still we are, we are uh, using no roboter. And at the moment, also, we do not use navigation anymore. Uh, maybe this will change in the next years. I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. The question is, why, why do you prefer the posterior referencing? The audience would like to know. Because I learned it long ago. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's eminent space. <laughs> okay. 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 Fine. If no questions. If there are any more questions, please. Okay. If there are no more questions, uh, thank you very much, Professor Wagner. Thank you for your excellent talk and. Uh, and thanks for uh, we'll keep associating it open. with you. We'll keep it open. If there are any more questions, we would like to. Yes. If you're going to. We'll keep it open. If there are any more questions, we would like to ask you. Later. Yeah, of later. course. Yeah, later. Yeah. There is one more question, uh, Professor Wagner. Do you do you check with the fluoroscopy all your replacements before you leave the operation theater? Yes. Always. Always. Because this has also some legal impact. I don't I don't uh, use fluoroscopy normally during a standard operation uh, during the surgery surgery. But before the uh, anesthesia is ended and there is a wound rape around, we do fluoroscopy because the patient must not leave the OR with a surgeon-induced problem. 100%. And also every osteosynthesis. If he is not happy with fluoroscopy, how will the proceed? In the surgery, if he's not the next, happy. The next question follows the previous one. If you are not happy with the fluoroscopic view, 
would you revise the surgery it's depending how terrible the image is if there is a major problem for instance a very rare intraoperative fracture of course i would revise it immediately and uh, also if maybe there is some bone cement uh intraarticular i would also revise it uh, immediately okay so thank you okay thank you thank you thank you professor wagner thank you now we go on to the next uh, speaker professor thomas randu chandrasekhar randu I request the next uh, moderator dr h s chandrasekhar and dr manjunath basappa to come professor randu painful art ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ very very comfortable to the patients and uh, around the world we expect around 10 to 12 percent of patients very unhappy uh, it is a great pleasure to invite your speakers in your with your experience why the people are unhappy with arthroplasty thank you very much mr ronda uh, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for the organizers for inviting me i hope i can be understood and heard and i will try to share my screen you can see my screen yes sir we can see your screen sir please go ahead sir excellent perfect thank you very much So um the painful arthroplasty of the knee it's a, it's a topic you can talk about for for hours and hours and so um I decided to to focus a little bit on the the diagnostic part of this because uh, eventually we want to find out um what the patient is suffering from So these are my disclosures uh so uh well Germany is much more much smaller than India and uh so the numbers are much lower um but from the percentage you can see we do have quite a few revisions we have 150 total knee arthroplasties per year in germany and around 20000 revisions and uh, we have around 600 certified arthroplasty centers and if you look in the registry data and in the analysis you see about 10 to 20% of the patients are not quite happy with the result of the total knee arthroplasty and so a uh, chronic post surgical knee is actually a, a common problem that we have and there's uh, been a review it's a few years old now and uh, meta analysis says that 10 to 34% of patients still suffer from pain after total knee arthroplasty uh, and so it's uh, actually a, a problem we do have to to look at and much more severe than in hip arthroplasty where the patients are much more happy and the results are much more predictable so The question is what are the most common reasons for persisting knee pain and total knee arthroplasty if you think of your own practice can you pinpoint it to, to a certain problem and actually i wanted to include interactive session here but it uh, didn't work out technically so i'm sorry for that i didn't i can't include the 
the online answering system in the PowerPoint uh, via Teams meeting. So we will discuss this after the talk, and I'm really interested on your your ideas, what you can say. And uh, for my own practice, actually, I have to say there's quite a few patients where I have to select uh, the uh, option I'm unsure or I don't know really what the problem is. And uh, this is something I want to uh, do a workup with you now and see uh, if we can find a solution. So where's the pain in the knee actually originating from? And this is one of my favorite uh, studies, although it's very old, uh, from uh, Dai. Uh, he's an arthroscopic surgeon, and he did the study with his uh, father, actually. And so um, there was an arthroscopy of the knee performed on the researcher himself, and it was performed without uh, uh, anesthesia, only a local an uh, anesthesia of the skin, and they inserted the arthroscope. And so his dad was going around with a little probe and touching different areas of the knee. And so the, the researcher could tell if he would feel any pain and if he could localize the pain. And so if you look at, these, uh, at this, you can see the, the cartridge surfaces, surfaces. There's a zero here, so there's not really any pain receptors there. But uh, the, most, uh, the most serious level of pain with a level four, or level three to four, is in the synovia membrane and in the in the Hoffer body in the Hoffer fat pad. Uh, and so some areas are not really you cannot really tell where the pain is originating from. Any, anything that has a B here, the researcher couldn't tell where the pain is originating. So the knee doesn't have proper receptors to really tell where the pain is coming from. And patients will have very weird symptoms and very weird uh, mm -hmm. sensations from the knee, and you cannot really trust on their um, on what they are telling you. Is the posterior, anterior, whatever, because the receptors might not even be there. So sometimes you see X-rays like this, and then you can say, okay, I probably know what the problem is here. Uh, sometimes you have X-rays like this, where you say, okay, the alignment is not really uh, perfect. There might be a mechanical problem. There might be a, a matter of stability. Uh, or a matter of uh, implant positioning. And sometimes you have images like this. Okay, you see this is a total rotating knee, uh, cemented, and you see a little bit of uh, implant loosening around the tibial implant, but the stem looks quite stable again, and the femoral part looks stable also, and it's fully cemented, so it's really not uh, much fun to revise, and it's uh, actually uh, likely that you will cause a lot of damage to the knee if you go to surgery with this case. Especially, you need to know what the problem is. We do bone scans, uh, scintigraphy in some of these cases to verify the loosening uh, of, the, uh, of the knee. But in my practice, I see very heterogenic results. It's not really, uh, doesn't make any sense to do this within the first 12 months of surgery because you will have positive results in all your cases. And they are very hard to interpret and very hard to read correctly. Uh, a, um, colleague to, to help you read these. Uh, and uh, actually, the results are not as promising as we thought like 10 years ago. And um, I don't think this is the, the key success here. So um, the, the issue is you need to do your diagnostics uh, fully. And this is a, a quote from the famous novel House of God. If you don't take a temperature, you can't find a fever. And so uh, Jay Pavlisi, who might well be considered one of the opinion leaders mm -hmm. in uh, revision arthroplasty from the Philadelphia uh, Research Group, um, he published this in 2012, and he says revision of the arthroplasty infection should always be ruled out, so always do your full workup. And this, again, is the question we have to discuss afterwards. Do you agree? Yes, a full workup is necessary in all cases to do. Or uh, if you see a mechanical problem, if you see an implant loosening, or if you see a malpositioning, you say, okay, I have a reason, so I don't need to do the full workup. I can just go to surgery like that. Uh, is it something really uh, pay a lot of attention to? So the problem with the uh, infection workup uh, is something I like to, to coin as uh, dangerous versus strangers. So and this comes from the immunological uh, paper. Um, basically, what makes differential diagnostics so difficult is that the announcement is pretty much the same, no matter if the causative uh, agent is uh, uh, wear particles or if it's a foreign organism like a bacteria. So we have an activation of T cells 
you always have activation of macrophages and eventually you have cytokines and chemokines, you have an immune reaction and you have an inflammation. But not every inflammation is also infection. And so it's very hard actually to tell these two apart from each other. And this is what the differential diagnostics is all about. The second problem we have also in the, in the research community uh, is that we don't really have a clear gold standard and uh, exact definition of infection. And it kind of depends on what society you look to. Um, uh, the MSIS has defined these major and minor criteria. In the last meeting, they came up with a, the scoring system where you can add scores for certain uh, tests you do. Then there is the, the uh, IDSA. They say, okay, if any one of these four criteria is present, there might be a PGI. And then you have the European Bone and Joint Infectious Society. They also say, okay, any one of these four criteria um, is, uh, indicates a PGI. And so depending on what uh, definition you look to, you have very different results. Uh, if you put in your, your test results to get the result, is it infected or is it not infected? And as long as we don't have a gold standard as a definition, it's really hard to, to get comparative results because the studies use different uh, patient groups. The main problem with uh, implant uh, diagnostics is the biofilm. As you all know, bacteria will stick to the implant surface uh, and create a biofilm within, uh, it's, the process starts within hours and is uh, probably finished within days. And as soon as the bacteria are encapsulated in this biofilm, uh, you will not get them off the implant without removing the implant. So it's essential to know beforehand if you have a biofilm or not. So sometimes you wish it would be as easy as this. So of course you cannot detect uh, your bacteria in, uh, in any diagnostic like this uh, easy. So what do we have to diagnose? Um, we have the detection of the pathogen itself in the microbiology, or we can try to detect the host response using serum biomarkers, by doing fluid analysis, by doing histology of tissue samples, and by doing radiologic imaging. And this is just a small collection of markers that have come up in the last years, and so I want to go through them with you. Uh, there's also algorithms you can apply, and this is the double AOS algorithm from a few years ago. And I love this because it's so simple. So if you have a patient that has a probability of a prosthetic knee infection and your uh, erythrocyte segmentation rate or the CRP are uh, negative, then you go to infection unlikely. And I think this is a very American concept because it tries to avoid the problem at all costs. So as soon as you have normal blood values, you can just say, okay, infection is unlikely. I don't need to do anything anymore. This is not our algorithm, and this is not what we do. We always go to join aspirate, and we always go to the full workup, even if uh, the lab stats are normal. The external uh, inspection of the joint can be helpful if you have a, a very obvious um, um, uh, inspection here. Uh, as soon as you have a, a sinus tract, this actually proves an EJI. Uh, sometimes you have what we call the positive mirror sign. You remove the, the bandage and you can look onto the prosthesis. Of course, this is infected, needs to go out. But uh, the uh, draining sinus is very rare. Actually, only 11% of the patients that are, have a chronic infection do present with a sinus strain. Uh, but if you have it, the specificity to detect PJI is actually uh, 100%. But in many cases, all external signs of infection can be missing. The knee, the hip, whatever you look at, can look perfectly normal and still can be infected. So do not trust on a negative inspection. In means of lab stat, I think, I think the C-reactive protein and the leukocyte count in peripheral blood are the most uh, established infection parameters. Um, actually, CRP has a, a fair um, a sensitivity and specificity, but again, uh, you do miss a lot of cases if you only rely on CRP. CRP can be perfectly normal and still infection can be present in the total knee arthroplasty. Uh, for leukocyte count and peripheral blood, it's not really useful. Um, uh, you have a very, very low sensitivity. Many patients with chronic low-grade infections do not have elevated uh, white blood cells. 
Um, but if you do have elevated white blood cells with no other focus, the specificity is uh, quite good, and you uh, need to use the uh, AI as possible. Uh, the gold standard to diagnose might still be the joint aspirin. This is uh, a paper from uh, Andre Krampus, which kind of made this, this method uh, popular, uh, and this was uh, published in uh, 2004 already, but still uh, stands, and still the, the cutoffs haven't really changed much. Uh, so anything above uh, 1,700 uh, leukocytes per microliter, anything above a percentage of 65% neutrophils in your aspirate are suspicious of infection. The consensus meeting of the MSIS in America defines 3,000 as a cutout, and if you look in the literature, you find different cutouts between 1,700 and 5,000 per microliter. There's differences between joints. Um, seems to be that uh, knee joints have a little lower cell count than hip joints, and so the um, the truth may be somewhere in between. It's not a black and white thing. But the more cells you have, the more likely it is you have infection. The higher your percentage of neutrophils is, the more likely you have infection. Um, but again, it's not a black and white thing. And you can have infection with low leukocytes and you can have uh, other reasons for loosening uh, or for persisting pain with high cell count as well. So we looked at this uh, last year uh, and we tried to find if we could make a more precise analysis of the joint aspirates, and this is uh, more into the basic research, but I want to, to show you that uh, there's research going on in this area. And so what we did is we um, marked the, uh, neutral, the leukocytes with many different markers, uh, not just to differentiate between neutrophils and uh, non-neutrophils, but also to detect T helper, T killer cells, CD3 positives, uh, natural killer cells, B cells, and so on and so on. And then you get, so if you send them through a fax analysis, you get very specific patterns of uh, um, leukocyte uh, types. And then you can compare these clouds and these patterns and you can analysis, uh, you can do uh, analysis of this. And then you get certain patterns of um, different reasons for uh, um, failure. But this is nothing for the clinical routine because most likely your lab will not uh, deliver this kind of a precise analysis and you can only do this if you have a fully equipped uh, fax facility with all the antibodies and everything and it takes a lot of time and it's quite difficult uh, but we are working on something like a, a quick test or a, a limited panel that you could maybe imply for this so maybe we have a better uh, more precise analysis uh, uh, within the next few years. So this is the contrast. If you don't have a lab available at all and don't, and you can't do a cell count at all, then leukocyte esterase comes as a very cheap and easy alternative. Basically, this is a, a urine analysis uh, stick that you can use, and it has a leukocyte uh, a detector on this, and you can put a little bit of locus, uh, of uh, synovial fluid on this, and then you get either a, a positive or a negative. The bad thing is that it turns from yellow to uh, purple, and if you have blood in your aspirate, it turns to red or purple and looks like it's positive. So it's very prone to blood contamination, and as soon as there's blood in your aspirate, you cannot really use it. And it's, uh, if you have the cell count available, you should use that instead because it's much more precise. This is just a surrogate marker or an alternative if you don't have a lab available. The second thing you always need to do is uh, you do need to do microbiology from your aspirate. And in our practice, um, it's very useful to use blood culture bottles uh, with the proper medium to send your aspirate because you have a much better detection rate. You can use the standard aerobic and aerob uh, culture bottles, but you need about 10 milliliters of fluid per bottle. So we need sufficient material from a knee joint. Normally you get quite a bit, so you can use that. If you have very little amount, we use the pediatric uh, blood culture bottles. They only need one to three milliliters of aspirate. So you can work with small volumes. And also they are not uh, selecting either aerobic or anaerobic bacteria, but they are more like a general medium. And you should always send these bottles as soon as possible. Don't leave them lying around. As, uh, they should be in the lab as fast as, uh, as possible. And actually with these uh, blood culture bottles, you can enhance your detection uh, for bacteria uh, as um, compared to, to swabs. 
if you have material available, always send it to the microbiology lab. Swabs are only an option if nothing else is available. If you use these little cotton swabs, you only uh, soak up a few microliters of fluid, and this is always worse than sending milliliters uh, um, to the lab uh, in a non-selective medium. This is also something that came up in the last few years, the uh, PCR, the molecular uh, biology analysis of the um, aspirates. And if you have a machine like this one from Coretis or this one from uh, Biomerieux, uh, it's very easy to use. It's basically sample in, answer out. So you have these cartridges and you put in your sample with a master mix. It's uh, as so easy that even an orthopedic surgeon could use it, but we send it to a microbiology lab uh, nevertheless. And these machines have a actually very high specificity, but only a medium sensitivity. And this is uh, surprising because with PCR analysis, you would uh, expect it the other way around. But the problem is that all these automated machines have um, a cutoff uh, built into them. So they don't only report the result as positive if the cycle number goes above a certain threshold. And so this threshold is put in uh, a rather uh, conservative. So they don't report all positives as actually positive um, because otherwise uh, you would probably treat everything as infected. Uh, and so currently we, are have, uh, we, we publish our results, uh, our first experience with these machines, and we included it into our uh, clinical routine. And we do this uh, routinely now with all aspirates. And we now run a study to reevaluate and see if it's actually any added value beyond the conventional microbiology, and we hope to publish this within the next year. Then there's the uh, wide array of biomarkers in the joint aspirate, and the most popular one, uh, because it's been uh, commercialized, is probably the alpha defensin. And alpha defensin was marketed by a Zimmer company as, as NovaSure lateral flow ELISA. So before COVID, um, it was always uh, fun in the operating room to do these because the, the nurse had to do it uh, on the side table and uh, you always had to instruct them on how to do this. Now with COVID around, everybody doing lateral flow elizas every day from their own swaps. So now it's very easy and everybody's used to this. Um, the lateral flow elizas actually are not that, uh, that good. The specificity is good, but the sensitivity Again, it's only around 86, 85%. So if you do a conventional ELISA and actually do a quantitative-based laboratory testing, then uh, you can increase your sensitivity and specificity by quite a bit. So this looks like it's the final solution to the problem. So why not just do the alpha defensin and uh, find all the, uh, the, the PJIs? The problem with these studies is they are mostly American. And so the def definition they employed is the MSIS definition. So by the MSIS definition, you're more likely to miss infections because you do need uh, three out of the five criteria to be fulfilled or one of the major criteria. So all those uh, that have low-grade infection, where not the, all the criteria are positive and where the MSIS says, okay, infection might be present, but it's not proven, they will go in these studies to the aseptic group and so you will likely miss them with the alpha defensin test as well. And if you compare this with the European cohorts, then the results are much poorer. So the next thing that is very popular, at least uh, among uh, European clinics, is the so-called sonication. So what we do is we put the uh, explanted material from the operating room into a, a plastic sterile uh, box and it gets sent to a microbiology, it looks like this then. Uh, the microbiology adds some fluid and puts them in a sonication uh, bath, the box like this. And then the uh, box is sonicated for a couple of minutes to release the biofilm off the surface uh, uh, of the implant. And then the fluid from the box is analyzed in microbiology. And also you should uh, do a proper sampling. At least four samples you should take uh, anything beyond seven samples is maybe not uh, not useful. Uh, in, in our hospital, I'm known for taking a lot of samples. Of, of course, I'm also interested in this scientifically and always want to know where the bacteria are hiding. Currently, we are doing a, 
uh, analysis of uh, which sampling site is most likely to give you correct results. So we're comparing uh, uh, if uh, it's rather capsule or synovial tissue or interface or um, intramedullary samples that give you the correct result. We always do the cell count, we always do the microbiology, and we always send everything that's explanted to microbiology for sonication. So there's a couple of new uh, things uh, around that have been published in the, in the uh, past two or three years that I want to, to show you as well. So the one thing was uh, plasma D-dimers, that this was published in the um, Parvisi group a couple of years ago, that they are a good uh, markers for periprothetic joint infection. And here from a Chinese group, they are publishing a plasma fibrinogen uh, to have a very good uh, differentiation between septic and aseptic uh, procedures uh, problems in the area under the curve of uh, around 0.85 and better than CRP, better than D dimers, better than uh, white blood cell count. Um, in our hands, actually, it's not really working well, but in our hands, also the, the D dimers did not work too well. I think it uh, depends on the patient population. If you have uh, rather old and rather sick patients, um, it's probably uh, harder to tell them apart because they will have elevated and changed levels of these um, uh, of these markers as well. Uh, we looked at uh, different uh, loosening parameters in the serum, uh, such as uh, rank ligand and osteoprotagorin, and we didn't see any, any difference in that. We looked at interleukin-6 in the serum and also interleukin-6 in joint aspirate, uh, and we looked at lipopolysaccharide binding protein, so more biomarkers coming up. But the problem with all these biomarkers is none of them is really uh, the, uh, the solution to all. So none of these biomarkers gets a sensitivity and specificity above 80%, and so the added value is, is very low. We tried to combine different biomarkers. We did a microelisa where you can do uh, 12 to 16 targets in a very small volume. Then you can do models uh, of the, all these different cytokines and try to evaluate uh, where you're going with this. But again, this is not suitable for clinical routine because no lab will do all of these cytokines from a small sample of, uh, of uh, synovial fluid for you. And again, we need to work on a um, suitable model for point of care testing, maybe lateral flow relies on different targets or something like that. But as you can see, there's uh, work uh, going on. We also looked at complement factors, again, very complicated and uh, some are elevated, some are not. And again, something to look into and to uh, reevaluate for the, for the future. So just one uh, small note uh, on the other differential diagnostics you need to consider. Uh, and I'm really interested in your uh, question and answer uh, session on the, um, on the issue of allergies, because I get the feeling that this is a very European or very German topic, and the American papers don't really discuss this. So uh, in Germany, uh, allergy testing are quite popular in patients that have a painful knee arthroplasty, uh, especially if you don't have any other obvious problem in your patient. We do uh, um, uh, allergic testing to the uh, metal components. And if the patient uh, says he, is, he has a known hypersensitivity, then we tend to use hypoallergenic implants with the coating on them to, to kind of mask the cobalt chromium uh, in, the, in the arthroplasty components. But uh, it's an ongoing debate if this makes any sense at all or not. And recently, studies have come out that show elevated serum levels of cobalt and chromium in patients, especially with uh, uh, hinged uh, arthroplasties and revision arthroplasties. And nobody's really sure on how to interpret this and if this is uh, of any, um, any interest. So this is a, a case we had. A patient was presenting with this um, uh, total knee arthroplasty. And we did all the workup. We couldn't find anything. And then we sent them for, um, for allergy testing. And we can see uh, this is the, the panel we are testing. It's the metals. It's uh, certain um, uh, bone cement uh, particles that we are testing. And so you can see a reaction here after 72 hours to benzyl peroxide, which is in the bone cement. 
And so um, this is something uh, you need to also um, look forward to uh, if, it's, if it's present and consider uh, uncemented knee arthroplasty beforehand. And also we tested her for titanium uh, alloys and she was positive to titanium, aluminum, uh, vanadium, which is kind of the standard material. And in this case, the stem here and the tibial plateau are made of uh, this material. And so it might be a reason for the uh, problems she ha she's having also. The problem with this case is that you don't really have an alternative. So you cannot uh, pick a, a prosthesis that is free of these materials. You can only use coating to kind of mask them and to hide them uh, in the uh, so they don't get released. So when you find the problem, you always have to see, can you actually uh, rule out other problems? Is it uh, possible to do a surgical procedure that you can perform and that the patient is willing to uh, to get that will uh, help you fix the problem? Uh, are there non-surgical means that you can employ and that you can use? And then you come to the operative uh, the solutions you can have. Uh, actually, the most common ones, uh, common ones are probably arthrolysis. So you reopen the joint, you remove scar tissue, and you make the uh, you get the range of motion increased. Um, then patellar resurfacing. Uh, in Germany, the primary patellar resurfacing of the total knee arthroplasty uh, is not that common. It's probably 10 to 20 percent of all knee arthroplasties that get a primary patellar resurfacing. In the American uh, market, it's quite difficult. Uh, different. Uh, many patients get a primary patellar resurfacing. Um, I don't know how it is in your practice, and I'm really looking forward for your comments and discussion on how you evaluate this. So then what's done a lot is the, the inlay exchange. So you put an inlay in that is a little higher to get more um, uh, ligament uh, stability. Uh, in my experience, this is rarely uh, the solution for the problem. Many patients uh, will come back with loosening uh, after a few months. Uh, again, when the ligaments are not stable in the first place, you most likely won't get them more stable with a higher inlay. And so if these things don't work, then you have to think about exchange of the total knee arthroplasty or removal. And so if you think about exchanging or removal, uh, especially in, if infection is uh, suspected, you need to consider uh, how long the duration of the symptoms is already going on. Is it uh, acute or is it a chronic uh, situation you have? And again, it's a matter of the biofilm. If the um, duration of the symptoms of the pain is more than three weeks, then most likely your biofilm will be mature and you will not be able to uh, save your implant. So you will have to go with an exchange. Um, if the patient is presenting with an acute problem, acute swelling, fever, acute onset of the problems, then you can perform the debridement and uh, implant retention antibiotics and try to save your implant. So a German uh, working group has uh, presented the idea of a new definition of a peripatetic joint infection. And uh, actually this paper is still in German and there's no uh, English translation so far, but we are working on an evaluation of this new definition. And I just want to briefly show this to you because what they are doing is uh, they borrow the TNM classification system uh, that is known from uh, malignancies and they apply it to different criteria of prosthesis infection. So they do tissue and implant conditions. Is the implant stable? And how do the soft tissues look around? Uh, then N is for non-human cells. So what kind of bacteria, what kind of pathogens uh, is in there? Yeah, are they difficult to treat? Uh, is there a, a um, fungal infection? And then M for morbidity. So what are the comorbidities of the patient? Is he actually able to undergo another surgery or not? And I like this uh, classification a lot because it pays respect to the very, very complex uh, overall situation of these cases, it's not just uh, onset of the symptoms, but it also considers how do the soft tissues look? How do the, uh, how is the patient? Is he in a condition that you actually can perform surgery or not? So these are all things you must consider before you go into surgery. Also, I like this classification because uh, the TNM gives the, uh, uh, reminds you of the malignancy of these, um, uh, these diseases. 
And actually, this is a, a quite recent publication from the Journal of Arthroplasty comparing the five-year survival rate of peripatetic joint infections of hip and knee to um, survival rate of uh, uh, common malignancies. And as you can see, you're more likely to survive uh, a carcinoma of the breast or carcinoma of the prostate than to survive a peripatetic joint infection of the hip and knee. So I think this is not really uh, in the heads of our patients and probably not really in, in our own uh, daily practice as well, that uh, peripatetic joint infections are indeed uh, a very malignant and very dangerous uh, disease and that patients will eventually die from these, uh, uh, from these um, diseases. And that's why you have to be so careful with your diagnostic workup and with your treatment. I'm sorry, the slide is in German. I couldn't translate it because it's, a, it's an image. So if you do the treatment options, uh, your options are basically debridement and implant retention. Uh, you do two weeks of uh, intravenous uh, antibiotics and then 10 weeks of oral antibiotics. You can do the one-step exchange or two-step exchange, followed by a total uh, of 12 weeks antibiotics. You can do the two-step exchange with a long interval, so remove the implant, wait for six weeks, then re-implant, and then do another six weeks of antibiotic. Or you can do um, a multi-stage exchange, especially in soft tissue, uh, problems where you have to do uh, vacuum assisted closure or flaps or something like that. It might be more useful to do these surgeries in multiple stages rather than all at once. I think this is very well established in the international literature and these are the options uh, that are uh, well known. Um, there's no consensus, however, on what is the best option. One stage versus two stage is an ever ongoing um, discussion. Um, basically, to sum it up, you can say if you're, if you're unsure, you're always safe on the two-stage exchange side. If you have the infrastructure and have all the methods, and then you can try one-step exchange, but the risk of failure will probably be higher. So, uh, since you have heard talks about uh, revision arthroplasty and these things before, I don't want to go into the uh, well-known uh, surgical options, but uh, for the last part of my talk, I want to highlight uh, one part that is often not talked about because um, many uh, surgeons don't really like that. And we do need to uh, consider that not every patient is suitable for a one-step or two-step exchange procedure and that we do fail in our treatments occasionally. And so if um, anything else fails, then we have to consider salvage procedures, especially in very old patients, especially in low demand patients. And so it's our own uh, goal to always get the, the best result possible. But we need to consider that it's not always possible to get this and that not every patient will actually benefit from a maximum amount of surgery. So in a failed knee arthroplasty, what are your salvage options? You have the option of arthrodesis. We have the option of just a permanent resection. We move all foreign material and leave the knee as it is. Uh, you can do a permanent suppression therapy. You can do a permanent uh, sinus strain to have the, the fluid go out. And you can consider uh, above knee amputation. So arthrodesis, um, we do have quite a, a few patients that we perform arthrodesis on. In most of these cases, the reason for an arthrodesis is a lack of extensor uh, mechanism. As soon as you lose your quadriceps and patella tendon or have severe damage to the patella, um, you might not be able to reconstruct the extension uh, mechanism or only with uh, a large amount of plastic surgery. And um, the results are not really that promising. Uh, and also the permanent arthrodesis helps you to stabilize the knee and to get some um, uh, uh, some rest into this uh, area and this helps to uh, get the soft tissue closure and actually the healing also of the infection. So this was a case we had with a polymicrobial infection, uh, some multi-resistant pathogens in there and a fully cemented uh, knee arthroplasty we had to take out. And as you can see, we have severe bony damage to the tibia uh, the patient already had severe damage to the extensor, extensor mechanism. The patella is almost gone, and you can see the calcifications in the ligament tissue everywhere. And so these are the cases where we opt for permanent arthrodesis. 
So the quality of life of these patients is actually not as good as you would expect. The, they have a moderate amount of persisting pain. On the visual and analog score, it's somewhere around 3 to 4 out of 10. And um, they can walk quite well. The infection resolution is quite well. But if you actually talk to the patients afterwards, many complain about uh, how handicapped they are in everyday life. They cannot sit in confined places that might include uh, buses and planes and theaters and movies and such things like that. So they always have to sit at the, at the side. The leg is always in the way. Uh, and so actually many patients are not that happy with the permanent arthrodesis. So you can consider amputation. And this is an image I took uh, on our last year's uh, orthopedic congress. On the left side, you can see the chief of my department, Professor Wirtz, and he's talking to two athletes of the uh, German uh, Paralympic team. And the one is uh, uh, doing uh, um, sprinting, running, and the other one is doing uh, jumping. And they are both uh, gold medalists of the Paralympics. And you can see how they are sitting here. You wouldn't, uh, uh, you wouldn't see that they have a severe handicap, actually. Um, the guy on the right is uh, amputated on his right, left, uh, right leg, and the uh, young man in the middle is amputated on both legs. And still, they run faster than... Uh, I ever will, and most likely any one of you ever will, and they jump further than uh, some people do with, uh, uh, most people do with healthy legs. But this is not the patients we are talking about. We are talking about old uh, patients with a long history of, um, uh, of disease with uh, many um, uh, comorbidities. And so you cannot... Uh, take the results of uh, young patients and uh, just uh, align them with, your, uh, with the, the ones we are treating. And so if we have cases like this, again, fully cemented, rotating knee, uh, infected, no chance of cell uh, salvation, or this one, uh, again, extensive mechanism was failed, the knee arthroplasty was infected for, I think, the second or third time. So this, uh, these patients opted for above knee amputation, and you can see here with a cemented stem in there, the bone quality was poor, a lot of bone was lost, and uh, um, the stump is rather short. Uh, and actually, if you look in the literature, the results of the amputation or above knee amputation are not really uh, very good. Uh, about 50% of the patients that get amputated due to a um, failed knee arthroplasty will never walk again. Uh, so 50% of these patients are stuck to a wheelchair or will be bedridden. Um, the, from the other 50%, about two-thirds can only walk short distances and they need walking aids like uh, crutches or a, um, a, a, a rollator to, to lean on uh, to walk. And so this leaves about 20% of all patients that get amputated that can actually walk uh, with an exoprosthesis and get a decent uh, mobility. So this is something you need to consider and also need to tell your patients that many of them will still be stuck in a wheelchair uh, and not be able to ambulate. So the last option is the permanent suppression or the permanent fistula. And this is a um, case of our own practice as well. A patient got a, a total femur due to a sarcoma and she suffered from a, a chronic low-grade infection. And so uh, she got a, a permanent drain from us, which is uh, working quite well. The, the drain is, um, is oozing a little bit of fluid all the time. But if you look at the X-rays over time, you see that this does not stop the, the osteolysis. So the, the bacteria are still on there, and they will still cause a permanent activation of the immune system and a permanent um, uh, immune reaction, and so this will cause uh, loosening of the implant, osteolysis, and as you can see, the cup is eventually failing and breaking into the, uh, the acetabulum, and uh, in the end, um, this uh, seldom goes well for a, for a long period of time. So the permanent suppression or the permanent fistula, you can consider for patients with a very short uh, life expectancy, for a year or two, but um, this is not a good option for younger patients or for high demand patients because 
uh, the, the bone loss will continue and the infection, the inflammation will continue and the quality of life of these patients is uh, rather uh, poor. Also with a permanent fistula, many patients uh, need help in uh, caring for this. Uh, many of these fistulas will, will close after a few weeks, so they need to come back regularly. You need to see these patients frequently to ensure that the fistula is okay. The permanent suppression therapy, you have the problem of resistances. Um, within a few months, most of the pathogens uh, will be resistant to the permanent suppression. Uh, and so you have the risk of uh, the patients going into sepsis and then no suitable antibiotic therapy um, that will accompany you all the time. So again, this uh, in, in, our, uh, in, in, in our opinion, these options are only available for patients with a short life expectancy. So I hope that I could show you uh, some interesting aspects of um, painful knee arthroplasty and failed knee arthroplasty. And I'm looking forward for your questions and your discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rando, for your very elaborative lecture on uh, prosthetic joint infections. Just a couple of questions. How do you choose your patient between amputation and arthrodesis? Um, can you hear me, Professor Rando? Yeah, I can hear you. So the question is to uh, how to choose between amputation and arthrodesis. Okay. So um, uh, most of all, it's a, it's a decision of the patient itself. So you have to uh, educate your, your patient on the pros and cons of these two um, options. Actually, I tend to uh, older patients, I will more likely tell that the arthrodesis is uh, more suitable for them because they will have a, a stable support and they will be yeah. more easily be able to, to emulate and to walk, while younger patients with a higher demand are better off actually with the amputation, because if they are able to get an exoprosthesis with a knee that can bend, they have a, um, a more natural walking uh, 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 gait, and they, have, uh, they are not as limited in their everyday life when it comes to confined spaces. Finally, the last question from me. What is your personal experience on single stage review? Well, I didn't understand the question. Could you repeat, please? No. And what is your personal experience on a single stage revision for prosthetic infections? Okay. Um, I prefer the two-step exchange because the single-stage revision um, is uh, very demanding in means of logistics. So if you opt for a single-stage revision, you basically need to perform two surgeries on one day. So you remove your implant, you clean out everything, you debride very thoroughly, uh, you put in uh, um, uh, some uh, irrigation fluid of, of your choice. There's no really evidence on uh, what is the best. And then you do like a, um, a, a closure of your wound. Um, you do a redraping. You exchange all your instruments. You scrub in again. And then you start the second part of the surgery. And then you do the reimplantation. So just from the lo logistic point, this is very demanding. You need to have a very good setting. You need to have an excellent operating team to get this all done properly. And the risk of uh, carrying contamination from the first part of the surgery to the second part of the surgery is very high. And so we prefer the two-step exchange. And what we like to do is the two-step exchange with a short interval. So we do 14 days of... Uh, a prosthesis free interval or spacer interval uh, if the pathogen allows. If it's not difficult to treat, if you have oral antibiotics available for, uh, for the treatment afterwards, uh, biofilm active, then we tend to do a two step uh, exchange with a, a short interval. Thank you.
Professor Andhavan, final again, because you have done so many two-stage revisions. Do you use uh, a static spacer or a dynamic spacer? Do you think it makes any difference? Uh, yes, it makes difference uh, in means of uh, ease of reimplantation. Um, as a rule of thumb, we use a static spacer if the implant we remove is uh, uh, with inframedullary components, because I always want to have some uh, local antibiotics in the inframedullary canals as well. So I use uh, titanium rods coated with the PMMA, with the double antibiotic loaded PMMA and insert them into the inframedullary canal, and then I um, uh, link them in the joint space and fill the rest of the joint space with PMMA as well. Then I have a very, very stable um, static construct that is uh, fully coated with the bone cement. Um, but if I remove a resurfacing then, and the inframedullary canals are closed, then I tend to leave them closed and do a um, a mobile spacer that uh, I, I use silicon molds to form them to look just like a, a, a knee implant and I put them in place with a little bit of bone cement and then I have a, a very good mobility and the patients can actually move the leg in a full range of motion if it's done properly. They, cannot, they should not have load bearing because the spacers can break easily. And so, especially for, for younger patients, higher demand patients, the mobile spaces are much nicer and the reimplantation is easier. If you remove the static spacer, you have to do a full release of the capsule and often you have to do a full release of the collateral ligaments. And in many cases, this ends in the uh, hinged uh, arthroplasty afterwards because you have to do a, a wide release to get the range of motion back into the knees. And so this is, uh, if, if you have older patients, and low demand patients, then this is not really uh, um, too much of a, an issue because you can do the, the uh, hinged arthroplasty easily, but I don't like to do this on a 60 year old. It's, um, it's not my preferred method. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Ander has been an excellent lecture on uh, prosthetic joint Thank you very much. Prof. Wagner, are you there still? Yeah, he's there. Yeah, he's there. Prof. Wagner, are you there still? I'm here, yes. Yes, you can hear. I can hear. Yeah, he is Dr. Chetan, who is likely to join you. Can you see Okay, him? hope to see you in, in April. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. welcome. Yes, yes. Thanks, uh, Professor Wagner. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> close it. Tell them close. close. Closing. So, so uh, good evening to all of you all, sir. We'll be closing this this meeting. It's a great thing that all of you all took your time to help us and share your knowledge, great knowledge with us. We conclude another successful edition of Bangalore Trauma Course. As is the trend we have set this year too, the webinar was hallmarked by scientific content and engrossing discussions. On behalf of the organizing committee, I express my sincere thanks to Professor Joe Schatzker, Professor Michael Wagner, Professor Thomas Rendo, and Dr. Arun Mulaji for lighting, enlightening us and Bangalore Trauma Course 222. It was an academic Diwali. I thank the scientific committee, the tech team, and Abbott Pharma for their cooperation in the success of this event. Most importantly, I my deep gratitude to dignitaries present online all over India and the physical people who are in Bangalore for making the Bangalore Trauma Phone Post a much-awaited event year after year. Thank you, sir. We'll meet you again.
hope we meet you with physical attendance next time thank you sir thank you bye Close it. thank you sir. thank you sir thank you